Welcome back to another episode of House of the Dragon. Episode 9 of House of the Dragon fulfills the promise of the series' previous eight hours, pushing the realm to the brink of a violent war for the Iron Throne, with the common folk of King's Landing caught in the middle. The Green Council begins no more than a few hours after the previous episode. King Viserys Targaryen, first of his name, is dead. King Aegon Targaryen, second of his name, now stands ready to rule the Seven Kingdoms, assuming anyone can find him. Queen Alison has taken Viserys's confused final words about Aegon the Conqueror, not Aegon his son, and ran with them. She sincerely believes her late husband wanted their child to sit on the Iron Throne instead of Ranra, the king's official heir for going on two decades now. It's a big misunderstanding on Alison's part, and one that's sure to get a ton of people killed. The first of those people to die loses his life on the very same night of Viserys' death. In the middle of the night, Alicent and Otto Hightower assemble the small council to share the news of the king's passing, as well as his dying wish to install Aegon on the throne. The news lands awkwardly within the room. What Alicent didn't know was that the small council already had their own plans to make sure that Aegon will sit on that throne. The only person not on board is the Master of Coin, Lord Lyman Beesbury, whose concerns are quickly silenced by Sir Criston's winning argument of smashing the other party's head on the council's table. Classy as always, Sir Criston. Further bloodshed nearly spills in the small council chamber, when Sir Harold Westerling removes his white cloak and abdicates his post as Lord Commander of the Kingsguard. I recognize no authority but the King's. And until there is one, I have no place here. He exits, somehow with his life still intact, but without a single person left behind who might fight against the power grab on the absent Ranra's behalf. With Lord Lyman out of the picture, Lord Otto, Sir Tiland Lannister and the other members of the council are free to speak their minds without fear of opposition. Word about the king's death must not leave the castle, so it is imperative that all non-essential servants are locked up in the dungeons, a scene that is observed by Lord Lara Strong, which is never a good sign. Time is also an important factor. They must act quickly to anoint Aegon and neutralize Ranra. And in case you're wondering what neutralize means in this context, it means killing her, her husband, and her children. This is where Alicent, who had been watching the whole debate in shock, comes out of her trance and draws the line. Viserys would never want his own daughter dead, not to mention his brother and his grandchildren. Still, she must agree that Ranra will certainly challenge Aegon's claim to the throne, so she must think of something to stop the princess. Perhaps there is one person still willing to extend themselves for Ranra, and it's an unlikely one, Alicent. In the hours following Viserys's death, Alicent and Otto race against one another to see who can find Aegon Targaryen first and install him on the throne. Whoever finds the soon-to-be boy king, lost somewhere in King's Landing doing God knows what, whoever find will be the first whispers in his ear, setting the tone for whatever comes next. Alicent quickly realizes her father means to kill Ranra and her entire family, which she cannot abide, despite all that's passed between them over the years. And so she sends out Ser Kristen and her second son Aemon to find Aegon before Otto's veritable henchman, the twin knights Eric and Eric Cargill can reach him first. One thing is for certain that Aegon is somewhere enjoying the pleasures of King's Landing. A game of cat and mouse ensues, as the four swordsmen, Kristen, Aemon, and the brothers Cargill don their very best disguises and crawl across the city in search of Aegon. Their respective quests take them through the bowels of King's Landing, discovering one of Aegon's many bastard children, not to mention a small army of kids battling each other for sport in an illegal fight club. All of these paths leads to Aegon, a scathing indictment of the kind of man who is about to assume the crown, and an early preview of the cruel kings of the future. One thing that separates Aegon from Joffrey Baratheon, is a complete lack of interest in taking the throne. He wants to be left to his own disturbing devices, but fate and a whole host of high towers have other plans for him. While Eric, Eric, Kristen, and Aemond are looking for Aegon, Lord Otto is holding court for all the lords that happen to be around at the time of Viserys' death. He tells them about the king's sudden change of heart and asks them to pledge their banners to Aegon. Those that decline his request, however, aren't met with an understanding look of defeat. Two of them are promptly arrested and one that was seemingly trying to escape the Red Keep to warn Ranra is hanged in the castle's courtyard. The only head of house who escapes Lord Otto's small purge is Lady Rhaenys, who was locked in her room by Queen Alicent. Alicent tries to reason with Rhaenys to make her drop her support for Ranra. She argues that Demon and Ranra are responsible for Laenor and Lena's death, and that none of Ranra's children are of Valerian blood. Then, Alicent moves on to flattery, telling Rhaenys that she should have been queen instead of Viserys. Last, but not least, she promises Rhaenys and her granddaughters the Driftwood throne. Still, 
the Lady of Driftmark is not convinced, and thus the Queen locks her up for a while longer so that she can do some thinking. While in the Junior Fight Club, the Cargills are approached by a young woman working for the elusive White Worm, also known as Demon's former lover Mazaria. With her little spiders spread all across town, she guides them straight to where the Prince is. The problem is the Prince didn't want to be found. He tries to escape the Cargills, and even promises Aemon that he will abdicate the throne and flee Westeros when his brother and Ser Kristen take him away from his original captors. All of this is to no avail. Aegon is taken to Queen and preparations to make him the next king are put into motion. The White Worm sure seems to have a good hold on the royals of King's Landing, perhaps just as good as Lord Varys. She even gets to bargain for the information she provides to the Lord Hand himself, stating that she will only reveal the Prince's whereabouts if the Crown puts an end to the child fights. Sadly, her reign might be nearing its end. Lord Larys is quick to inform Queen Alicent that there are spies among the castle's servants and even quicker to burn down the dungeons where they were locked up just as he did with Heron Hall. But Lord Larys has a price. For the first time since his inaugural conversation with Alicent, we see what he truly has to gain from offering her his help. It turns out that it is not power that he covets, or not just power, but a bit of feat action. And what better feat to appease a lord's fetish than the queen's? Extortion and weird fetishes aside, things are going well for Alicent. She names Ser Kristen the new commander of the City Watch and manages to convince Aegon to accept his fate by telling him about Viserys' last words. She even advises him to be kind to Ranra. Whether he will listen to her is a different matter entirely. The prince becomes king in a packed ceremony, forcefully attended by all the peasants of King's Landing, who clap enthusiastically for their new male monarch. As for the nearby lords, they all swear fealty to King Aegon, second of his name. However, Rhaenys is not without allies in the Red Keep. Ser Eric breaks her out of the castle and tries to get her out of town through Blackwater Bay. What he wasn't counting on was the tsunami of peasants that filled the city's streets on the way to Aegon's coronation ceremony. Rhaenys is dragged along, disguised with a grey burlap cloak, but the fear in her eyes soon turns into joy when she realizes where the crowd is taking her. Once inside the castle, she makes her way to the dragon pit and rescues Maelys. She then proceeds to smash into the Great Hall on Dragonback, breaking everything in the way and most likely killing some people in attendance. There's panic among royals and peasants alike, and the now King Aegon shivers in fear when Maely stops right in front of him. Alicent runs to protect her son, but he was never in any real danger. At least, not immediately. Instead of Dracarising the entire royal, Rhaenys simply has her dragon roar and then turns to leave, probably to warn Ranra, as well as give the king and the queen mother something to be really a. Eh.